how to peel a banana, all right? <laughs> now, you think now, I know how to peel a banana. You grab it and you pull it back. No, 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 no. You, you know the fool's way of peeling a banana. I'm going to teach you the monkey's way of peeling a banana. Because we all have moments where we grab it from the top and it's like, it's really hard to open this fur infuriating bent yellow thing because we've been doing it wrong the whole time, people. If you watch a monkey peel a banana, they don't start from here. They start from here. They squeeze it and they peel. Ooh, this is so much easier. Go home. Buy a banana if you don't have one, and try it. I need some potassium, so. <laughs> it is the easiest, easiest thing in the world, and we've been doing it wrong our entire, entire lives. That was a bad decision. Now I have to swallow this thing. <laughs> there we go. All gone. <laughs> the power of education is undeniable. Education can change a life it can change a family, it can change a community, it can change a nation. We know this. This is why schools are so vital to the future of any community. This is why uh, a proper sense of stewardship and discipleship over the next generation is so important. Education is so, so important. As the famous saying goes, you know, give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, he feeds himself for the rest of his life. There's a great uh, quote that bounces off of that by John Eldridge, who says, teach a man a rule, and you help him solve a problem. Teach a man to walk with God, and you help him solve the rest of his life. I love that quote. Uh, I said it once at CU20, and one of my young adults came up to me and says, I got a better one than that. This is Nathan Banks, if you know him, by the way. He says, I got a better one. Build a man a fire, keep him warm for a night. Set a man on fire, keep him warm for the rest of his life. <laughs> The passage we are looking at today is the last of the trustworthy sayings that we're going to be looking at. It's Paul's trustworthy sayings we find in 1st, 2nd Timothy and in the book of Titus. Today we're going to be in the book of Titus. And though we are treating it as one trustworthy saying, really it's two, but they are so interconnected and so knit together, so similar in intention and in uh, sort of direction that we can treat them as one saying very perfectly naturally. The passage we're looking at is in Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11, ending in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 8. This is a summary of the gospel. If you want to try and understand as we go through all of it in just a moment, what is really going on here, well, think of it as a summary of the gospel. But it's being said for a very specific purpose. It's supposed to invoke a response, a specific type of response. What Paul is saying here is this, these summaries of the gospel are to be taught because they change lives. They change your life. You will be changed, you, your congregation will be changed if you teach these things. And they'll be changed in such a way that they will live godly and fruitful lives. We're going to read it together, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, and then all the way down to 3, verse 8. <clears throat> For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and author authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. 
At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to do to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Please would you pray with me? Lord, as we approach your word, God, as we seek to unpack it and to truly understand what's going on, Holy Spirit, help us open our hearts, open our ears to understand. Meet us in this place. We pray, Lord, we give this time over to you. May you be our teacher this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So what's going on in this passage? You can quite distinctly divide it into two, from verse 11 to verse 15, and then from verse 1 to verse 8. They, they, it, they're almost mirrors of each other uh, because the intention of it is very similar. We find what is Paul's intention in saying these things in the first two verses and in the last verse as well. The grace of God teaches us. This is the point of what he's saying. In verse, in verse 12, he says, oh, sorry, verse 11, it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It, that is the grace of God, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness. The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness. Grace is our teacher. It is personified as the one who is teaching us, guiding us our counselor throughout this life. This point is reiterated at the end in verse 8 where he says, this is a trustworthy saying and I want you to stress these things. Which things? Well, the grace of God, everything he's been talking about in all these passages beforehand. Speaking about God's mercy, speaking about his love, speaking about his grace. Stress these things. So that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. If you teach these things, those who you are teaching will devote themselves to doing what is good. Stress these things because the fruit of it is that people will do good. They will devote themselves to doing good. Grace is our teacher. It... it it changes us. It changes our lives. If you could say the whole sermon today in one sentence, the sentence would be this. The gospel has the resources to lead us into godliness and make us people who are eager to do good. The gospel has the resources to lead us into godliness and to make us into people who are eager to do good. That is what's being said here. This is what we are being taught. We are being taught how to be godly, how to do good. And we are being taught by the gospel. The gospel has opened up a new way within us. It has freed us. It has brought about new ethical, moral possibilities into our life. It has unlocked doors in our heart that now we can go through with a greater sense of love, a greater sense of mercy, a greater devotion and love for God. The gospel has made these choices now available to us, things that we probably couldn't do before because of the nature of our heart without God. But now that the gospel has come, it teaches us how to say no to God ungodliness, how to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Now, how does it do this? How does the gospel teach us? How does it change us? Well, the first thing that the passage speaks about is that it puts the motivation within us as it shows us the future. See, because of the gospel, we know the end of the story. 
We know who God is. We know what He's doing with this world. We know what is going to come. And because of that, we change how we live. We know what awaits us, and so we prepare for it now. The future informs the present for us. We live and we love in accordance with what we know will come. We know what is true. We know what is lasting. And so to focus our time on temporary things, to focus our time just on the pleasures found within this world, well, we know it's foolishness now because we know what's going to come. We know who God is. So we're motivated by this. The future informs our present. And so destructive ways of lust and of pride and greed, ways that would cause us to turn our back on God or to pursue gain only in this world alone, following the passions of this world, that is no way to prepare for God's future. That is no way to live in accordance with what we know is true. Even deeper than that, Christ has given himself for you. You focus on the relationship you have with Christ now, that he ransomed himself for you. That's what the word redeemed means in in verse 14, that he gave himself for you, that you are his own possession, that you belong to him now, and that, that he made that possible. That should make you eager to do what is good, eager to please him, He's your Savior. He's your God. He's your Lord. This should change you. This should make you eager to please Him, eager to do what is good. Christianity is not rules without reason. God is not arbitrary in what He asks us to do. We have action born out of theology. Action born out of theology Yes, there is lots to do in this world. Yes, there is plenty that we have to put our hands to to accomplish. But it's never arbitrary. It's action born out of theology. It's because we know that we are creatures of God's generous love. That we have been remade by God's generous love. As a free gift, He has freed us from all that previously polluted our lives that we have become new, that we have become free. And out of that mindset and out of that heart, we live. Previously, this passage says we were foolish, we were deceived, we were enslaved, we were hated and hateful. And in that place, God came to us and saved us. He had kindness on us. He had mercy and love and grace on us. And all these passages speak of this, but It's alluding to something that it never mentions. You see, it's talking about the gospel. This is a summary of the gospel and really the headlines of what the gospel has done. But it never tells us exactly what the gospel is because Paul assumes Titus obviously knows what the gospel is and a lot of his audience knows what the gospel is, as I'm sure many of you know what the gospel is. But I don't want to assume that. I want to go through the gospel today. Perhaps there are some people in the audience today who do not know what it is that we as Christians hold on to. Perhaps there are some who think they know but don't. And perhaps there are some that have forgotten and need to be reminded, have a refresher of sorts of what the gospel is. So here it is. Christians have a central event that informs all of our faith, that without this event, We don't believe anything, really. If this didn't happen, if this is false, all our belief falls apart. The central event of Christian faith is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus, the Son of God, dying on the cross and three days later coming back to life. This is the central event of Christianity. And it seems obscure because it's like, well, this this Jewish man died 2,000 years ago and suddenly I'm saved? Seems weird. But I'll tell you why it's so important. Because on the cross, Jesus Christ is taking the punishment that we deserve so that God would make us free. See, there is a transaction taking place on the cross between God and humanity. 
And that is the central event of the Christian hope. What you see on the cross is this. It is the only way that God could wipe away sin without wiping away you. It is the only way he could wipe away sin without wiping away you. Because God takes sin seriously. He takes brokenness seriously. He takes disobedience seriously. And he cannot simply forgive because there is no justice there. He is like our legal system. You may regret what you do, but if you break a law, there is punishment. There is a cost to this. And what we see on the cross is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, takes the cost that we deserve upon himself. And I think no passage says this better than Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned in our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And this passage uses words like transgressions and iniquities and, and speaks of being healed by some kind, by, by, of some kind of sickness. But what is this talking about? This is sin. You need to understand sin if you are to understand Christianity, if you are to understand the gospel. The fact is that no one in human history has ever responded to God the way in which they ought to have. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This means that no one has honored God the way he should have been honored. No one has been grateful to him to the depth that he deserves. No one has trusted and obeyed him to the level that his authority and wisdom demand. No one has. No one. Instead, we have honored and praised ourselves. We have created for ourselves false gods and given them praise and given them honor instead of giving it to God. We have taken credit for ourselves and have ignored Him and showed no gratitude towards Him, disrespected Him and disobeyed Him. And all of this is sin. All of this has done huge damage in this world because this leads to pride and, and self-righteous anger and selfishness and greed and lust. And all of these attitudes have done untold damage to our own hearts and to the world around us. And they all come out of this broken relationship with God, selfishness, like self-righteous anger, greed, lust, and pride all come out of the fact that none of us have related to God the way in which we ought to have related to Him. And as a consequence of this, none of us deserve to be in His presence. None of us. And if none of us could stand in His presence, the only other option is that we are cast out. We are cast away from Him. This is just. This is fair. This is what everyone deserves. And we can't change it. We can't make up for it in any way. You could work at it your whole life. You, you'll never make it. You'll never get there. And into this pitiful place, this prison of our own making, Jesus steps in. Jesus comes into that place and he takes the punishment that you deserve. He is cast out of God's presence in the way that we deserve. He takes the pain and the terror and the agony that we deserve so that we could be made free, so that God could give us freedom, that God could redeem us and ransom us out of that place. And he does it because it is his joy that you would be with him. It is you are the object of his love. And him being raised to life is the evidence that all he said was true, that he is who he said he was, that his claims are true and trustworthy, and he is God, and, and we can follow him, and he does provide salvation. Now all your sins are paid for. You are free. You have clear access to God now and forevermore. The account is clear. Your debts are paid. You are free now. This is the gospel. 
And this is the message that Paul is telling Titus, teach this. Teach this to the people. It is excellent. It is profitable for everyone. Because learning this, accepting this truth, should change you. It must change you. And if you're looking at your life today and you're thinking, I can't think of any change that the gospel has made in my life. Well then, there are two possibilities. Either you are perfect and you were so good even before you heard it that it made no change in your life. I doubt that. Or you haven't really accepted it yet. You're still on the road. You're still far from understanding the gospel. Because this would change you. We should live differently in light of this. See God differently. Righteousness should come out of us. Respect for other people. A generous love for God and for others. If you are not showing the same generous, kind, and forgiving love that God has shown you, if you're not showing that to other people, then you have forgotten the way in which you came to God. You have forgotten the path that you traveled in order to know God. We owe Him our lives. We owe Him everything. And He's asking us to do this for other people. It's not too much to ask. It is definitely not too much to ask. Three times in this passage, in verse 8, in verse 14, in verse 1, and in verse 8, we are called to be people who do good. It's such a bland word, good. What does it mean? What does it mean to do good? N.T. Wright says this, Good is generous and helpful actions on behalf of the wider community. Generous and helpful actions on behalf of the wider community. That is what is to define our lives. We are to be eager to do good. If the gospel is in your heart today, then your heart is right with God, and you have within you an intense regard for the poor, an intense regard for doing good, for godliness, for humility, knowing that Jesus had to die for you, that He had to die for you, that God's view of righteousness and justice is so high that Jesus had to die for you, means that your view of justice will be extremely high too for doing what is right in this world. See, we can't get away with simply living a moderately good life. As so many would say is, you know, the, the answer to how to get to heaven, well, live a moderately good life and that's enough. Jesus Christ had to die for you. That is how strong God takes justice. That is how important justice is to Him. You can't simply live a moderately good life. That's not enough. That will not be pleasing to God. Because of His view of justice... Ours changes. We look at this world and we see injustice being done. We see people abusing each other. We see people who are victims of violence, victims of persecution. And we do not stand idly by. Because we know that is not what God would do. We know that is not what God's heart is. We stand with the oppressed. We stand with those who are hated. We aid them. We help them. We are peacemakers in this world because we understand that God takes justice very seriously. And so because of that, we do too. And then knowing that He freely saves you changes the way that you see other people. Verse 3 tells us how we were without God. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasure, living in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. That is where you were. That is who you were before God's grace comes in and saves you. And knowing that strips you of all pride and pretension. When you look at the people in this world who are poor, who are difficult, who are damaged, you should see yourself because that is who you were apart from God. 
and God helped you. God came in and helped you. And so he's asking that you see others with that same heart. When you see the dysfunctional and, and the, the depraved in this world, you see them with the same eyes as God because you see yourself in them and you know that God had grace and mercy on you. And the gospel unlocks the doors of our hearts that we might have love for the difficult people in this world. We might have love for those who are still in that place of darkness and deceit. The gospel makes us zealots. That's what the word eager actually means in verse uh, 14, eager to do what is good. It means zealous, that zealot. What is a zealot? A zealot is essentially a fanatic, a fundamentalist, an uncompromising uh, person of religious pursuit. It's what you would say is a terrorist, a zealot. And we are to be zealots for good. We are to be fanatical about love, about generosity, about, about freedom. We are to be terrorists of mercy. That is who we are to be. That is the incredibly strong language that is being used of us now. Fanatics of gentleness and respect. That is why the gospel must continue to be taught to the church. Because it directs our hearts and our minds towards these things again and again. It brings out the fruit of, of, a, of a heart that has been touched by God. God honoring and sweet. The gospel is the foundation of all truly Christian conduct. Each and every person in the church. And the church as a whole has a context. And inside of our lives and inside the lives of us as a body of believers, there are issues that need to be resolved. And there are problems that we will face. And there are opportunities that call for a specific Christian response. And we need to be doing good in this world. If you're sitting there today thinking, what can I do that is the right response right now. You are thinking the right question. In light of the gospel, what can I do? How should I live differently in light of the gospel? How can I stand with the marginalized? How can I be generous in this world? How can I seek justice and peace in this world? How can I live a godly life, self-controlled, upright? How can I do these things? You can be taught by the gospel. Nelson Mandela says this, No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can also be taught to love. The gospel is our teacher. Grace, the grace of God is our teacher. So the question I leave you with this morning is, will you allow the gospel to teach you how to love, how to live? Perhaps this morning you have forgotten the way that you came to God. Perhaps you still have doors in your heart that are still locked, that are waiting for you to turn that key. Perhaps you are people who have become too busy with the present that you have forgotten the future that God is bringing. Perhaps you have forgotten to whom you belong, and that is Jesus. See, the gospel is a trustworthy lesson because it has within us the resources to bring healing, to make us people who are eager to do good, to remake us into the image of our Savior, those who are zealous for good. Let's pray together. Dear God, may you remake us into the image of our Savior. Jesus Christ, thank you so much for all that you have done. God, help us to live in response to all of this. We thank you so much. We praise you this morning for you are the only one who deserves praise. Highest of all in this world. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I guess please stand together and we'll give a benediction as we go out.
Remember, you can go downstairs now and, and grab some, some coffee and some snacks. Uh, you can stick around for ABF in the second service and, and come back for lunch uh, after the second service. We'd love to meet a lot of you, I'm sure. <clears throat> May the grace of God teach you this week. May God the Father and His love be with you as you go out. May Jesus Christ and all His grace and generous love be with you. And may the Holy Spirit's fellowship be with you and teaching you this week. God bless you. You are dismissed. Have a great week.